This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well now, there are ways to start on an average safari and then there are magical ways to start on a live safari. And an elephant calf that is just a few hours old, well I think it's safe to say we know where that one falls. A very good afternoon to all of you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Sebastian is on camera with me. And we are live from Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. I don't want to take my eyes off the little one. So now that we've got that out of the way, remember you can send through your questions and your comments on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or alternatively, you can ask us questions in the YouTube <laughs> chat stream. It just wants a drink, Mom. And they've just come down. For those of you that don't know, we have a camera at the waterhole here. And it has just come down for a drink. It planted its face in the water. It was too adorable for words. I didn't even know they had such flexible hips. And is now desperately trying to have some food, Mom. Looks like a little girl. Look how wobbly. Wobble, wobble. Wobble, wobble. Okay. They've crossed over onto the other side of the waterhole. And the good news is, is that I can now see the guests at the lodge going to go on their game drive, which means that we can quickly nip across the damn wall and follow it, which is what I was waiting for. Oh, I'm so excited. Mom's a little bit unsettled. So we're going to approach this nice and cautiously. But I'm going to try and spend as much time as I can with this little one. Oh, it's just too adorable for words. I think they're going to go and find a nice feeding spot. Let's do this backwards quickly. They're going to go find a nice feeding spot in the shade. They might even go and have a little bit of a sleep. I'm hoping that might be the case because they've got such a brand new herd member. And this is what's so special about elephants is that the entire herd will band around the little one and make sure that it is safe and protected and the fact that it needs a little bit more extra sleep than they do will mean that they take care of it, they'll all stop, they'll guard it, they'll give it some shade if necessary. Oh, too sweet! Just a couple of hours old. Okay, as we catch up to this little elephant, there are several people out this afternoon. Sydney is one of them, and he's going to tell you what his plans are. A very, very good afternoon, and welcome to the beginning of the afternoon safari. I am Sydney Pumulan Mikosi, and I'm traveling with Senzo, who is my camera operator. We are going to be looking for the lions this afternoon. Hopefully, we will find them sleeping somewhere. And for your questions and comments, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. So the sun is very much hot this afternoon, which is a very nice weather in order to ground the predators such as the cats. They don't roam around a lot when the sun is strong like this. Chances of seeing the animals who have been spotted this morning are very much high. So I hear this morning there has been a couple of sightings, lion sightings and some leopard sightings. So now let's go to uh, my other colleague. So we are going now to the Masai Mara where James is just about to depart. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this end of the Sunset Safari. I am in the Masai Mara in East Africa, in Kenya, and we are sitting with the Sassage Tree Pride, and they, of course, are having themselves a good Sunday snooze. My name is James Hendry. Please ask us any questions you'd like to using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or, of course, the YouTube chat stream. On camera today, we have got Manu El Bandito Akatsa. There he is, making noises. And over there, we've got Kinky Tail. She's lying in the grass. She is the most recognizable lion in the Sausage Tree Pride. 
They are obviously not doing an enormous amount right now, but we're pretty sure that there are young cubs in this riverbed just below where they're having a snooze, so hopefully they will pop out at some stage. We also have heard reports of a chitar uh, not too far from here. Manu will point the camera sort of vaguely in that direction, and we'll head towards there, I think, while these chaps sleep. The focus, of course, is going to be on these lions because we have our TV show later on today. So I think we'll probably stay with them for the duration of the TV show. If uh, there are some strange communications, we do have some strange communications issues with the final control at Juma, but they seem to be okay at the moment. So just be patient with us there. Let's go back to Juma now, where Jamie is with an Ellie. I'm with several Ellie's, but unfortunately, I think in this scenario, we're not going to be able to follow that little one as much as we were hoping we could. They're very, very unsettled this afternoon. I think perhaps that female's birth has caused a bit of upset in the herd. Remember how I said they're very protective over their little ones, even if it's not their own baby? And that one female on the left gave us a very stern look as we made our way closer. So we're just going to sit here, nice and still. We're going to wait for the female with the baby to come to us. I think it's actually having a nap at this point. They've made their way into the shade, and I think that's what it's doing. So you can see some of the older babies of the herd all settled down around the Tambuerti thicket. That one's throwing its trunk around. You're trying to grab some sand. After the last few cloudy, very cold days, it has now heated up quite nicely. There's still a nip to the wind, but in the sun, it's probably, what's it, around about 29 degrees centigrade? Hey, girls, it's okay, it's all right. What is up? I'm far away, it's okay. Nico, Nico viewer, that tiny, tiny little baby that you saw earlier, you want to know how much it weighs. It weighs around about 100 kilograms, believe it or not. So over 200 pounds. When baby elephants are born, they're born at around about 100 kilograms. So even though this thing looks minute, it is actually, I mean, it's the baby of a, the largest land mammal on the planet. So it's tiny in comparison to them but not quite as tiny as you might expect it to be. Hi, big girl. If you have a look at this elephant, you can see the deep indentations around her forehead. Now, that's indicative of age in an elephant like this. So she's quite an old female. You can see her skin starting to hang around her hip bones, around her spine. So I would guess she's definitely over 40. I would probably put her even older than that. So one of the senior members of the herd, if not the senior member, if not the matriarch. They're moving slowly. We just have to be patient in this situation. If we reposition now, if we try and see that baby again, they're going to get very upset with us. There it is. It's between the legs there of the, of the one dust bathing. There we go. Here's a little one. Backing up, big girl. I'm backing up. It's okay. It's all right. There we go. Whoopsie. Got to reverse straight, Seb. Not into a tree. It's all right, big girl. There we go. If I stop here, is that okay? Is that all right? Unfortunately, my car is making some very peculiar sounds. So in that situation, I probably could have stayed where we were and we would probably have been absolutely fine. But the way in which she approached it, you can see her body language is unsettled. It's okay, it's all right, girl, it's okay. Now talking to her has absolutely no real impact on how she experiences the situation. But they do respond to tone. So by talking low and calm, it's just an extra way of trying to de-escalate the situation. Right, I'm going to take my foot off the brake now, Seb. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was... <laughs> I was, My right leg was slightly... <laughs> slightly tense there. 
So we probably would have been fine to stay where we were, but I didn't want to get it to the point where she was very close to us because she did approach in a very determined way. Now what she's doing is putting herself between us and the tiny baby, which is exactly what we spoke about. And then the shade as well. Maybe she just wanted the shade. No, I don't think so. I think there was a degree of discomfort there. Now one thing that I was not looking at was whether or not she was flapping her ears because contrary to what people think when they see elephants, that is not a sign of aggression and that's to answer Joshua's question about why elephants move their ears all the time. On a hot day like today, that is their way of cooling down. So it's basically an internal cooling system. There's the baby there, Seb, it's popped out. So it was suckling from mum. So it's a sort of an internal cooling system. The skin is quite thin and packed full of, inside underneath the skin is packed full of capillaries. Oh, you're too sweet. And the blood flows very close to the surface. So they move their, they move their ears, which is something this little one's going to have to learn to do because it's not quite at that point yet. And they move their ears to create airflow over the ears. That cools down the skin, which cools down the blood, which then circulates to the rest of the elephant's body. Look at it, it's still got white patches on it. It's been covered in dust now. I think it's put its face in the dirt. Cull six, yes, potentially a car horn could scare elephants off. It could do the exact opposite and actually provoke them. So a loud, surprising noise like that could have worked, but really it was for me to back out of her space rather than trying to scare her off in any way. She was doing exactly what she should, which is protecting her family. And I noticed they were unsettled even when they were at the water's edge. So it was just for us to back away and to give her a little bit of space rather than the other way around. See how she stayed, even though the rest of the herd have moved now. It's all right, big girl. So we could, we could have, I mean, we've actually disconnected all of the car horns, given what happened to us once during a TV show going into an ad break, when it decided to have a mind of its own and just blare at us during an actual TV show. Yes, that was a wonderful time going into ad break. But yeah, the elephant's body language is a very, very important part of reading them. So while you don't have to look at the flapping ears, you do have to look at the ears occasionally. Now, ears out and head up is an indication of an unsettled elephant, as well as a very stiff tail. That is, the tail is the best indicator of mood. Now, these elephant's tails haven't really been swaying there. That's a good example of a nervous elephant. Now we're okay again because we're catching up with our family. Hey boy. And you'll notice that there's other vehicles that are making their way in as well. So what we also didn't want to do was be in a position where they felt sandwiched between the two of us. I had a feeling they'd been trying to call me. But also I think what provoked her and why the other vehicles are fine with them is the very strange sound that our vehicle is currently making. Jigger is, and her name is J-I-G-G-A, the car that I'm driving, she doesn't sound very good. She's making some very peculiar whining sounds and I think that might also have exacerbated the problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the vehicle back quickly to see if I can catch the mechanic. So while we do, I'm going to race off in that direction. I'm going to send you across to Tristan, who's been racing in the opposite direction towards Klanamba.
Well, we are racing in the opposite, well, we raced in the opposite direction. We're not racing anymore, as you can see, we did stationary. Now, theoretically, we're exactly where we left Clalamba this afternoon, and I mean this morning, and she's supposed to be here, but I don't see any sign of her, so we'll kind of have to look around a little bit. But as Jamie mentioned, my name is Tristan on camera. I've got Craig. This is a warm welcome to Rusty, and I hope that you are going to enjoy your afternoon with us. Now, theoretically, she's supposed to be inside of this grassy tuft on my left-hand side. This is what I'm told. Uh, Jackie and, and Trishala and Lauren spent the day here, and they said that she hasn't moved, but I don't find a leopard inside there. I've just looked now to try and see, but I don't see her unless I'm just looking in the complete wrong tuft at the moment, which is not a good thing at all. So I'm just going to try and see if I can find some sort of sign of her here, and we'll just do a little kind of bypass and just try and check what's going on now she could be just lying somewhere slightly different the, the guys said that she hasn't moved and now i know for a fact that in terms of not moving she should then theoretically be inside here so i'm just trying to see it is a wall of grass and so maybe just maybe she's curled up in there but i don't see any spots at all or any sign of a little face poking out and i would expect her to have lifted her head or her ears at some point. Now I've driven around the other side as well and I don't see anything inside there either so hmm, I'm a little bit kind of skeptical that she maybe maybe just did a little runner and no one actually even noticed her moving out the back side of this grassy kind of area because I don't see any kind of signs of her and get, normally with her she's quite kind of watchful so as soon as she sees a car she kind of pokes her head up to see what's going on and you know, I haven't seen any sort of movement like that and I'm trying to peer into it I might be wrong I'm, she might be lying right here and we just can't see her which would then kind of show how camouflaged she can be but I somehow don't think so if I'm honest I might be wrong though let's check I hope she hasn't moved because that will be a bit tricky to find her then Rima no not necessarily um, you know she's waiting for mom so her instinct or her kind of way of doing things is to just sit still and wait and hope that mom is you know um, comes around and so you find it with cubs um, they sometimes do sit in the same spot particularly if it's quite warm and hot then you'll find that they will just kind of take it easy in the same area but what I am surprised about is the spot she's chosen that's what I am surprised about this is not the greatest of the spots for a little leopard to sleep in now it looks like she was lying all over here but I don't see any sign of her Craig do you see anything no I don't see a leopard inside here which oh there she is right there ah so she's not in the grass at all I've now spotted her she's directly in front of us sorry Craig I'll move us now but I don't, just got to be a bit careful. So she's sitting at probably thinking, what are these two doing? Driving around like clowns. There she's sitting in the quarry thicket over there. <laughs> anyway, let's try and just reposition Craig so he doesn't have this quarry bush in his face. There's a quarry right here that's hitting Craig. So let's not get Craig all tangled up. Craigie, yeah, I'm going to move you around now. I'm surprised I didn't see her. I was just, I suppose when you're not looking in the right direction, this is what happens. Right, now, I'm going to just reposition and find myself a little bit, bit of a better spot. And so while I do that, let's send you back across to James, who's on the search for a different kind of spotted cat, one that is a lot faster. What we are doing while Tristan gets himself a little bit of a spot is trying to find a cheetah. We've left the sausages. We will go back there as the sun starts to set. But we are told and have seen evidence of Nasirian, the cheetah, cheetahess, can you call that a cheetahess, female cheetah, and two little cubs. Now she's somewhere around here. We've had three or four reports. We have an Ascari called Elvis with us. He's not singing us a song, uh, but he is going to try and help us find the cheetah, which apparently was around here somewhere next to this fig tree that looks like a giraffe. He doesn't look like a giraffe from here, but from a distance it really does. I thought it was a fig tree with a giraffe underneath it. Until Manu said, no, no, that is the fig tree with the giraffe, you know, that looks like a giraffe. There it is. Very good. Now, what we need to do from here is scan, because apparently underneath 
one of these Balanites trees or desert date pa desert date trees, we will find Nasirian the Shatar. Hold your thumbs, everybody. I do want to see this cheetah. Please, Nasirian the cheetah, show us your face. Where are you? Are you here? There's a topi. You see the topi, Manu? Yeah. Unfortunately, the topi does not appear to be alarm calling to anything. Let's carry on. There are a couple of termite mounds that you might just be lying behind. Yeah, Roxy, you're absolutely right. The trees are beautiful here. We go up the way. Right, I'm just getting a few directions from the back which is useful because I don't know what I'm doing in this particular area. A couple of rocks here. It is the most stunning afternoon. We came out early because we were terrified, A, that we wouldn't find the sausage tree pride, and B, that it would rain again, and we wanted to be in position such that if a storm came through here, we'd be safe and with an animal. But it's turned into the most glorious afternoon. It's a lovely sort of balmy, I guess it's around about 29 degrees I'm told, which is 84 degrees Fahrenheit odd, which is very pleasant. And the place is just the most magical colour. Ooh, a couple of nasty rocks around here. And she'll definitely be lying in the shade somewhere. And so all we have to do is find the right bit of shade. And given that there isn't a massive amount of shade around here, that shouldn't present too much of a difficulty. Unless, of course, she's gone back to her cubs. Now, apparently they're in a den somewhere around here. Someone else lurking in the shelter of a bush is Clalumba, the huntress. Well, yes, we've got little Clalumba now who's still sitting under a quarry bush. You made me think that you had disappeared, but you were lying right there. If I had just opened my eyes, I would have kind of seen her quite easily. So if she had been a snake in the grass, she will have probably bitten me. And, you know, unfortunately, well, fortunately rather, we eventually spotted her before we tried to move off too far. But I'm sure she's highly highly sort of bored at this stage I don't think she's going to be very happy with mom when mom gets back mom's going to be in in the naughty box um, instead of her being in the naughty corner unless of course mom has food if mom has food well then you'll find that this little one will probably be as boisterous as ever and will be running circles around mom as mom takes her to whatever carcass she might have found but you know the, the fact that we're seeing her being left for the, the time period that she has been over the course of the last two days is probably indicative of just that Tani is starting slowly but surely to increase periods of time away from Kalamba in the hope that Kalamba starts to utilize this time to learn how to hunt and to find food and to be able to kind of make it on her own and so I'm not surprised that this is happening I mean it's about the right time that you start to see that but look at that face hello little one oh that's a big stretch <laughs> she's super cute isn't she she has been so chilled with us the past kind of two, three drives and I've thoroughly enjoyed spending the time with her. Now, MGM, you're going to ask me and I'm draw I actually, I know this is ridiculous, but I'm drawing a blank as to what her name means. <sighs> yeah, that's right. Thank you, Kirsty. Sorry, I'm getting old, Kirst. This is what happens. But anyway, her, her name means mischievous or boisterous, which is now that Kirsty's told me exactly how I would would have remembered it and um, it's quite fitting because she is mischievous this little one or she certainly was very mischievous as a little cub and as well when mom's around you'll see that she is too she goes all over the place and runs around like an absolute hooligan when mom is um, present she'll go in circles and she'll be up and down and on trees and down trees and looking and chuffing and generally being a bit of a hooligan so she is a bit mischievous and when she was tiny she used to just do her own thing all the time she used to kind of move around and 
um, never listened to mom and, and and that's basically why she earned the name it's also well because you guys all voted for it too I suppose so it was one of three names that was given to all of you to vote for to see which one you liked best and so little Columbo was what it was finally settled as so nice name though difficult to say but nice name it's it's always fine when it's on your own so if you just say Columbo by itself we're all good but when you add the little tandy factor into it that T sound is different to the T sound of her name and I always get tongue tied with it. Uh, it drives James absolutely mad. There was also a stage where she was being called Clalalamba which drove James and Scott around the bend. I think both of them were ready to um, commit a, a, a mass um, execution of their fellow guides at one point because that was what was being said but obviously we know it's Clalamba. There's no Clala in that name so that was all sorted and the best person in the whole camp to say Clalamba's name is Kirsty. She is so talented at saying it. She's the best one. Like she has it down pat. She knows exactly how to, to say it. It rolls off her tongue smooth and, and silky. <laughs> She's laughing at me because Kirst has a problem with saying Clalamba. She, it always just comes out in a spew of A's and L's and M's that just don't really make the word up at all. So it's quite entertaining kind of listening to Kirst try and say it. We always have a good laugh. Hello, little one. <laughs> Just call it Cub, yes, Tundi's Cub. It will be forever known as Tundi's Cub in Kirsty's mind. Even when she gets a new one, this is still going to be Tundi's Cub. But you can see she's half sleepy but half bored. I think she's kind of wants something to happen, but it's still a bit warm and windy, and she knows that we're here and we're talking and we're around, and so probably in all likelihood she wants to kind of get up and move and, and carry on, but she knows she has to be waiting for for mom some of her kind of way she looks at us I often think she's almost well particularly this morning and this afternoon and maybe even a little bit yesterday evening she's got this almost like I want to play with you guys but I don't really know what we're allowed to do if I'm allowed to come close to you am I not she almost has that kind of thought going through her head at times because she's got a little kind of playful demeanor to her and I wonder if she's quite curious about this car and, and what goes on um, you know we haven't spent, like I was saying, awfully, I mean, a huge amount of time on our own with her. You know, mom is normally present, and in that case, her attention is mostly on her mother. But now that she's kind of spending so much time alone like this, I know Brent's found her recently by herself, and I've had one or two sightings of her on her own. But this is probably the most drives we've strung together in a row without mom being present. And she almost seems to be kind of curious as to what we do and the way we speak and, and how it all works. And so... I'm curious to kind of see how she interacts with us for the rest of the afternoon as if she's going to just fall asleep at my dulcet tones or if she's going to basically wake up and start to move around. So Kathy, um, viewing of cubs without needing their mom there, um, generally until about eight months. So eight months you wouldn't really view her without mom. Um, you normally try and kind of keep them to, or leave them to themselves at eight months old. Obviously if you find her you can have a short sighting and then let them go. Um, but now that she's a year old, you know, she's more than capable of climbing trees and, and figuring out things on her own. And I watched her last night with the hyenas that approached her, because during our rehearsal she was on top of the termite mound and the hyena came along and she didn't even bat an eyelid, she just looked at the hyena, the hyena looked at her. They both kind of said, oh, too much effort to go anywhere and left one another alone. So she's, you know, she's figured things out and at a year old she needs to because theoretically Tandy could leave her in the next two months like she did with um, Tumba before and she's going to need to figure things out and obviously once she's on her own we can view her so it's important that we also start to spend time with her away from Tandi because otherwise she'll never get relaxed with the fact that the vehicles are here and so she's had a pretty long period to to live life by herself and for us not to stress her out too much by herself but now you know as we start to get to a year old she's going to be starting to hunt and do her own things and she's more than fine with the vehicles around when, uh, as you can see we're not exactly stressing her out at this stage Although she's watching Batman now, look at the size of that paw in relation to her head when she's stretching. You're just doing all the poses today, aren't you? It's almost like she's just listening to what we're saying and kind of watching what's going on. Hello, little one. You're so serious. You like your brother. You know that. 
Yes, she's enjoying the conversation about her royalty and herself. It's quite funny from my angle, which you probably won't have, is you'll see that there's two leaves in front of her face from the guari tree. Now, that those two leaves there, from the angle that I am at, when she puts her head in a certain way, those are the perfect little moustache over her nose. It's quite funny. I'll try and line it up just now with Craig, because it's hilarious with these two little green leaves like hanging down on either side of her muzzle. It looks like she's got a um, massive moustache and there was an Australian cricketer that if some of you may be maybe we should google because he had a, an epic moustache that looks a little bit like this when her face is aligned and his name was Mervyn Hughes who was a bad boy cricketer and he was you know all over the place and he had this huge handlebar moustache and this kind of looks just like that over her face except it's a quarry bush moustache, should I say, and so it's very, very cute. When she, it's just she needs to get her head in the right place, and unfortunately, where Craig is is not quite the right sort of view. It also obviously blocks her face a lot. If I kind of put Craig there, but we'll we'll try it just now to see if we can get the little quarry moustache on little Claire Lumber. What are you doing? Right, I'm going to try and see if I can find some sort of place to align the leaves on her muzzle. And while I do that, let's send you back across to James Hendry, who's playing, apparently, Where's Waldo with the cheetahs of the Masai Mara Triangle. All I got from that link, everybody, is that I'm going to find something to lump a lead with Columba's moustache. I don't think that's what it was. Anyway. We are still trying our best to find the cheetah on this gorgeous afternoon. Not feeling in the slightest bit frustrated, not feeling in the slightest bit precious, because it's so pretty. Oh, it was about Columba's moustache, I see. That's very odd. I didn't know Columba had a moustache. I have never find a moustache in a woman to be particularly attractive. But each to, each to his own. Oh, a leaf moustache. All right. Well, that's okay then. Now, I think I'm told that she has a den somewhere in between these two hills, which I think are the things we're heading towards now, but it really is a, a little bit of broken telephone that you get out here. And apparently she was lying without the cubs earlier today, which means she could easily have left them at least left where she was to go and feed them. So we'll just pop around here. There are elephants about, so if we see some, we'll show them to you. But, I mean, just being in a landscape like this is, is magic. It smells so clean, there are hardly any other vehicles around. We basically have the place to ourselves. All 50,000 hectares or so, some 100 and 20,000 acres. Zach, my favorite thing about the Mara is the space. I mean, uh, yeah, really, if you look at that, that is my favorite thing about the Mara. It's just endless, gorgeous, gorgeous views. Obviously, the animals are spectacular as well, and it's lovely to have so many here. But it's the real sense of space that you get here. I think because you can see so far. You know, the Mara Serengeti is no bigger than the Kruger, but obviously in the Kruger you can't see the same distance. And so it just gives you a sense of real space. And I guess because it's parkland, in other words, because there's short grass and trees dotting it, it makes us psychologically feel very comfortable. There's a psychological um, phenomenon in human beings where we seek out parkland with a few tall trees but a fairly short grass underneath that's why we design our parks like that and it comes from way back when when we just learned to stand because it means we can see for a distance but we still have the security of the trees quite interesting I think all right let's keep going no luck as yet We will go back to those cheetahs, at least to the lions, if we do not come right with these cheetahs. You know what else? We didn't used to have signal in this area when I was last here, and that was all rectified during our gauntlet series. 
and so it was very special to be able to drive in this area and share it with you. Alrighty, Sydney is looking for some Leons, so I think we'll go and find out how that search is going. So I am now busy trying to get hold of the fresh lion tracks. It seems like these lions are much more towards the uh, Gary Cut line. Somewhere there is where maybe we might be lucky and find them. I'll just go check that area as well as the Buffalo Hook Dam. As the Buffalo Hook Dam is the nearest dam to where these lions has been spotted earlier this morning. The wind is too much here where I am. So there's no other animals here in this area. Maybe this is a sign that the big cats are somewhere around here. So I'm going to have to look very carefully because these kind of animals can lie down flat. And it's not easy to see the lions when they are lying down during this time of the day unless you know where exactly they are. Still no tracks at the moment. Soon as I pick up some tracks, I will be able to tell where, how much time we are going to take to find them. So now let's go to Tristan. with little Clalumba. You can see she's now found a nice little spot to rest her paw. Is that comfy girl? Do you like that little spot? Yes. Okay. Well, you're welcome to like whatever spot you want. But you, you can see there that Gwari's made the perfect little spot to kind of hang one's paw over. I'd imagine it's much like leaning against a shelf or something like that. That is what it would kind of I would think it would be or leaning against a, a sort of bar counter or something. Maybe she's a, she's a little bit young for the bar counter, Clalumba, although maybe you need to perfect your skill for later in life. She's getting to that age where she's going to be going out on, on the town at night and, and going and checking around things on her own. What are you noticing? The wind is really blowing at the moment and so I'm pretty sure there's a lot of noise and a lot of sounds and lots of kind of things that are disrupting her from trees rustling to grass moving and there's a few birds that are chirping and so I'm sure she's just kind of watching out from all of that. Connie I would imagine maybe in the initial phases they would probably I suppose when they're really young they don't even know what's going on and so being left alone probably doesn't mean anything to them really and then they just get used to it um, but I would imagine if things like lions come past or they get chased up a tree or something like that then I'm sure they go through a period of anxiety or at least an emotional stress um, but for the most part, I, I don't think so. I think it's more boredom than anything else when they're sitting like this. And you can imagine, she's been sitting here for since yesterday morning waiting for mom to return and be like, come on, let's go somewhere else. And she's just had to kind of sit it out and wait. Now, what will happen eventually in time is that she will start to move around a lot more. So she'll start hunting, she'll start going and looking for water. And eventually the, the periods of time is just going to increase in more and more and more. And the, the sort of aggression from Tandi is going to be that much more that she's going to have to be left kind of on her own and figure things out. But I think it's still a little bit early. She's so little, I, I, I would be a bit nervous of her being on her own at this age um, already and being left to do her own things. I think it would be a very tricky period for her if she were to be left by herself at this time. I mean, she's still very little in comparison to, you know, some of the, um, in comparison to, you know, a lot of the other leopards out here. I mean, to compete with that skittish female up near Buffalo, so Tandi, um, Puchava, uh, you know, Shadulu, it's, it would be very tricky for her, and, and, and even Inkanyeni to a degree, and Inkanyeni's daughter too is going to come of age, and 
you know, she's going to have a tough time of it to to stay out of trouble and stay away from anybody that's going to try and hurt her. So I'm hoping that Tandy is kind and keeps her for a little while longer, maybe sort of, I would hope, six more months. And that should get her to a nice sort of size that she'll be able to then look after herself a lot better. Like I said, I remember with Shungila, it was the exact same. Shungila was tiny, 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 tiny at around a year old. She looked as though she was half the size of Hosanna. And then in the space of about six months, she really grew quite a bit. As soon as she started making her own kills and developing, um, you know, she started to really kind of come into her own and, and develop in size. Ultimately, she was still quite small, and obviously Tundi sort of chased her away, and, and we know that there was that whole inter interaction. But I, I would be very 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 kind of hesitant for her to go now and i'm hoping that she'll show a similar pattern to shongile and actually start to really kind of move and to try and kind of actually um what would you call it um grow and be able to then hunt So Ladybird, her eyes are quite interesting. They've changed color slightly. They, I mean, when we first started to see her, they were, weren't actually the brightest of colors and they didn't really look like they were going to be anything spectacular. But in the last few months, they've almost starting to take on a little bit more of a kind of greenish color. If you look at them there, there's a sort of slight undertone of green. It's not much, it's mostly sort of yellow base to it, but there is definitely a bit more of a lightness in that eye. I mean, she's starting to really kind of get these beautiful eyes that, that the Tundi's kind of cubs are known for. She's always had cubs that have had pretty eyes. Um, and so, you know, she's almost taking on that, that light kind of yellow, or almost translucent yellow with touch of greeny blue in them which is very very pretty so she's got a really nice kind of set of eyes I'm I like the eyes that she's got obviously Tumba's eyes were extraordinary and, and beautiful in his own right but hers are, are really taking on a nice color now and it's often what happens with with leopards is as cubs their eyes are a certain color and then they slowly but surely start to change a little bit as they get a little older and you'll find that the in depending on which leopard it is and the eyes get a little bit more subdued in terms of the vividness of the color if you take Tiana for example she had sapphire blue eyes and when I say sapphire blue I mean they were blue 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 and those faded somewhat and have now become more like Anderson's eyes which is this kind of gray gray blue but very very light and not not the same sapphire blue that we've been seeing on her when she was a cub and so you see that with the cubs they, they are kind of changes and, and, and gets a little more muted as they go but hers is definitely getting more of a green tone to it um, as she's getting older which is quite nice but I think she's got beautiful eyes. She's got a very serious face though, look at that. Hello, you little one. Ah, delightful. So, just so you, everybody knows, it's this, apparently Jamie Patterson is is apparently a TV star now. She's, you know, gone to the Mara, done TV, become famous for her work with hyenas and has decided that she doesn't actually want to participate in the afternoon show anymore. She'll do TV this evening, but the rest of the time she's going to go and spend her time back at camp with her feet up being pampered and being brought um, all kinds of things by the trainees so she's apparently uh, this is through the grapevine she's ordered caviar and um, champagne in order to sit back and relax while she gets a facial that's just what the grapevine is saying and um, I think it's probably because she hit all-time fame actually this morning with her poetry she's from what I hear is being coined as the next um, Shakespeare the Shakespeare of the modern era um, and so she's now you know it was just too much work this morning for her to do another game drive this afternoon and so she's decided to go put her feet up until such time as TV comes around where she can then be the star of the show once again so for now she's going to just take it easy back at camp <laughs> she's apparently saying that I shouldn't be jealous as she's putting on her charcoal face mask because yeah I'm not jealous at all I'm sitting with a leopard which is probably for me the best place to be. We all know that as long as I'm out and there's a spotty cat around, I'm quite happy with where I am. So I don't mind at all. But um, Jamie, I hope you enjoy your, your pamper session and your your relaxed um, afternoon. I, I, I'm just glad that you're getting some time off. You know, the, you know, I wouldn't want to work you too hard over the course of the next few days. You know, you, we obviously know that you are vitally important as the star of the show and so we will pamper when we need to now what i'm going to try to do is while little Lumba's got her face up 
Did Jamie say a naughty word to me? That's naughty, Kirsty. I'm gonna try and line up Craig. Craig, can I ask you just to keep, I know it's gonna be a bit rough, but I just wanna see her face with the, the little moustache. Let's see if we can get this right. Okay, little Clolumbe, you've gotta keep your face where it is. Oh no, there's gonna be a stick in the way to line it up, perfect. If I get it right, I can also come home, Craig. Let's see, go in tighter there, let's have a look. Oh no, her face is not quite right. It was almost there. If she just drops her face, <laughs> come on, put your face back, little Flalamba. The little moustache is the perfect thing. Let's see if she'll do it. I think she will do it eventually again, but at one point she had the perfect height on her face that it was just sitting directly over her nose. But there, you can see if she drops her head down a little bit, can you imagine that over? It will be hilarious if we can get this right. Come on, Flalamba. Put your nose down a little bit so we can see you with a little gory moustache. <laughs> Kirsty says this is where we need a laser beam because cats always chase lasers around and so we can just make her kind of put a muzzle down. Although I don't think a laser beam would work, Kirsty. I think she'll be too active for that. So what we want is for, to get, for her to get a little sleepy and just to drop her face slightly and look kind of down a bit. I know, she's, she is very close, I agree, Kirst. It almost seems like she's going to get it right. The problem is, is there's squirrels alarm calling, so I wonder if Mom's on her way back to our south. There's some squirrels. There you go, look at that. Well, we can say she's got a gory beard now. It may not be a moustache, but she's got... <laughs> she's got a little gory beard at the moment. And <laughs> I'm sorry, girl, we're making fun of you, aren't we? But it's all in good jest. Everyone's enjoying it. There we go. There's, yeah, there's the little... <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> she looks like a catfish. <laughs> it's also like it's, it looks like one of those those olden day Chinese moustaches or those you know those ones that are long that hang down. It's it really is quite wonderful. I like it. I think it's fantastic. Clamber, <laughs> don't look so angry with me. I'm sorry, go. <laughs> There we go, Kirst. I knew you would enjoy that. I thought it was quite cool to actually see. I'm glad that all worked out because obviously with the camera angle and my angle is two different things. So sometimes when we see something, the camera doesn't quite get it because it's a lot steeper of an angle than what I have. And so you end up with these kind of different sort of looking things. But luckily, Julie, exactly. It is Movember. Clalamba is doing her bit for Movember. There it is. It's... <laughs> It is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, no, just move. There we go. That's it. <laughs> That's perfect. When it comes out of her nose, it's just... <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> Uh, sure. The things that keep us entertained at this time of the day, this is what happens when we spend time out here in the hot sun, is that we our brains get stewed. Anyway, we're going to sit here and enjoy this a little bit longer while Jamie Patterson takes it easy up in camp. But the other one who's not having as much fun as what we are, or Jamie, is James Hendry as he's still playing his game of where is the spotted cat up on the plains of East Africa. It must be nice to be a TV star, I think. I think it must be great to be just a TV star. That uh, Thompson's Gazelle is not a TV star. It's now a minor internet celebrity. Anyway, we're sitting here. We have yet to find our cheetah, but what we have found are two glorious Oribi. Look at those. Are they not magnificent? We are still searching for these cheetahs, but as I keep saying to you, as way of by way of consolation, we are looking for lots of other things and seeing beautiful landscapes, orbies, Thompson's gazels, and general beauty. Well, Jamie Patterson has herself a little cup of coffee. Isn't that gorgeous? Those are not common. In fact, that's the best Oribe sighting I've ever had. It would be just slightly better if there was a cheetah chasing them. Look at the way they run. Magic. 
Yes, Kirsten, it would be sad if they died, but we just want the cheetah running after them. We don't necessarily want to see them torn limb from limb, do we? No, it would be disgusting. All right, we're going to continue along here. Going towards two very large fig trees, and then we're going to bend our way around, and if we don't have any luck, we'll go back to the lions. We don't want to lose them. It's not very warm anymore. I mean, it's warm, but it's not hot. No, Debbie, I don't know anything about the wild dogs from this morning, I'm afraid. Uh, you know where they came from, where they're going. I do know that they went into the villages straight away, so whether they ate goat for breakfast, I'm not sure. It's the one, or one of the disadvantages of not having se secure fences in an area like this. You know, they, they, we just bleed onto community land, which in, in one respect is wonderful because the wild animals go into the communities and they've actually developed a really pretty good understanding of each other. But on the other hand, wild dog goes into communities and starts killing livestock, it's a problem. And so I don't know where they came from, who they are, but it was so exciting to see them. Um, as you may have noticed if you were watching this morning, uh, Corley got fairly excited by the fact that he was seeing wild dogs in the Maasai Mara for the first time. He's sitting behind me, his teeth are showing. It's very special indeed. So we're going to cut down through this little valley once we get to the two big fig trees and see if we get lucky. We may, we may not. We'll do a little scan from the top here. Ooh, rock. Eh. Kathy, we're very close to the equator. We're almost on the equator here. We're just a little bit south. The equator is... I don't know how far north it is. Manu, do you know? Let's have a scan through here. I'm not sure how far away the equator is, but it's really not far at all. You do cross it in Kenya if you go north. And so, really, a very pleasant climate here, especially because we're so high up. You've got some pigs there, Manu. Well done. Pigs. Wart pigs. Oh, there's a huge sound of wart pigs, that. Don't look very panicked by life. Of course, a cheetah would think twice about taking on a wart pig. But the wart pigs don't always know that, you see. Every time I see a Thompson's gazelle herring around the place, I assume it's being chased, but sometimes they just hair around. No, I see nay cheetah. I suspect those are not the only two fig trees next to each other in the whole place, but they are very distinctive. The reason I say that is that we've been told to look for them while looking for the cheetah. Gorgeous. Just gorgeous. And we should have a fairly gorgeous sunset as well. I'm sure you can feel the peace of this place just by looking at your screen at these magnificent vistas. It just is utterly, utterly breathtaking. Well, Joshua, the migration never ends completely. The migration continues regardless. Uh, just doesn't happen to be right here where we are. Most of the animals have gone down south into Tanzania, but actually just over the ridge to the northeast of us there is a place called the Salt Lick, which many of you will be familiar with and in fact there are huge herds of zebra and wildebeest still around the Salt Lick. And we passed a few herds of wildebeest and zebra today on our way down here but basically over that ridge there that you're looking at is the Salt Lick, and there you will find fairly substantial herds still, oh certainly three days ago you did whether they're still there, I'm not sure, but most likely. Oof. Really 
is the kind of place you need to sit and just soak it all up. Mm. Like drinking it in, really. Yes, you can hear a bird. Thank you, Kirsten. The bird you can hear is the wattled lapwing. You can hear it going... It's not a very peaceful Sunday afternoon sound, but that is the sound it has chosen to make. All right, I think we'd better carry on. That's an elephant skull there. So an elephant popped its clogs, as it were, some time ago, over there. Righty. Good. Shall we carry on driving? Let's carry on driving. So the two fig trees, little road going down this way. Yes, here we go. Might be lucky. OK, let's go back to the other cub of the moment. It's not so much a cub anymore. Well, no, exactly. You're not so much a cub anymore at all. She's gotten quite big these days, and I suppose she still is, you know, got a bit of a cubby face. She's trying very hard to have a stern stare and get rid of the cubby face, and I suppose us making fun of her of having a Fu Manchu um, moustache really doesn't help in this case at all. But uh, like I said, we weren't having fun. We were laughing with her. So you've always got to remind yourself. But she's now decided it's sleep time. Enough entertaining with moustaches and the likes. She's going to just lie down and have a little bit of a nap. And I suppose this is what happens when we spend time out here for long periods and, and not much goes on, is that we start to come up with ridiculous things um, that leopards get to do and, and obviously entertain ourselves somewhat. So I can only imagine what it must be like for her to just sit here non-stop all day long waiting for mom to come out. I am surprised though that, you know, obviously this morning we saw a hunt with a lot of vigor and energy and all seriousness try to go after some impalas. It wasn't like she was kind of taking it easy and just doing a little playful hunt. She was really hunting properly. And it surprises me that since then she's just not done anything because there's still lots of impalas around this area. I've seen quite a few different impalas kind of moving about. Um, they're on both sides of the drainage line where we're sitting at the moment. So there's a drainage line just to our kind of, what would we say, north, I would imagine, hey Craig? Northwest, somewhere there. Um, and there's impalas that are kind of on both sides of that so there's some on this on the far side there where that termite mound is in the background um, that was where I last saw some of them and then there's some just to us kind of south and so I'm surprised that after that hunt this morning she hasn't tried again um, to go after anything maybe she's just kind of decided that it's too bright now and that she's gonna rather wait for mom maybe she thought mom would be back a lot earlier than what she has now I'm hoping that tonight Tandy does come back at some point So one of the Nico Nico viewers, no, we haven't searched for um, Tandy too much. I, I did drive, so basically what happened is yesterday, this interaction happened with hyenas, the kill was stolen um, in the morning, and Tandy went south. So Tandy went towards Cheetah Plains um, in Koro Chitra boundary. Um, and from there, no one's seen her. So I've driven the fire break, which runs to the south of the block that we're in. No sign of any tracks coming back north. Um, obviously, we can't traverse in Koro or Cheetah Plains. And so, you know, Chitwa, I asked the guys, they said they haven't seen any sign of her. It's not to say she isn't there. She can be elusive in the place where she's crossed on Chitwa is a nightmare for finding a leopard. It's very, very dense bush there. Um, so she could just be in there somewhere, uh, it wouldn't surprise me. And so what the best bet for us is, is obviously we could drive around and try and find her, but if she's got a kill, she's going to come back to Kalalamba at some point and come and fetch her and take her back, or she, at some point she's got to arrive back here. So the, the bet is to rather just sit tight with Kalalamba and wait for mom to arrive. And um, the other thing is, is that I just wanted to spend more time with her. If I'm really honest, I'm being selfish a little bit. Hopefully you guys don't mind, but I we, we get so little time with Tandy and Kalalamba because of their way that they're spending time on Torchwood and we also know that difficult cat to find is Tandy um, on, at the best of times and so when you've got an opportunity to spend three drives in a row with little Kalalamba 
it just feels like a really nice thing to do and, and eventually mom's going to come back and getting that moment of them rejoining and coming back together is very special and on top of that if we can follow them back to a kill if she does have a kill it means that we then have the two of them for a longer period even further and we have a better place to start if i leave Klalamba now and let's say tandy comes from this western side where there's no road up this drainage line and then takes her back i won't have any idea where she's gone and it'll be very difficult for me to be able to or any of us to be able to find her again and that means that we won't be on kind of on top of what's going on with them and that's the problem with Tanya and Klalamba they're actually not too bad if you follow them every drive and you try and keep looking for them it's when you lose them for a drive then you've done then they generally are gone and move all over the place and it becomes quite tricky to find them once again so you know I think it's best plan for now is just to sit with her and, and hope that mom comes back and that we can follow where they go i'm hoping that tandy wherever she is did not kill on Encoro because obviously that means that she's going to come here grab a little one and back onto Encoro in a space of about 10 minutes and there won't be really much that we can do about it and also we don't want them to go that side that's not the side that we can drive we want our little ones to be this side and to stay in our area i doubt that she'll go too far south though with quarantine being around and also um, you know that, that skittish male that seemingly is spending time around Chitwa. I, I doubt that we're going to see too much movement of Tandi to the south. She might go and explore on her own, but I don't know if she'll take little Kalamba that side just yet. Right now, while we kind of spend time with Klalamba and see what she gets up to, let's send you back across to Sydney, who's still on the trail of the tawny cats. I just got the tracks of the lions here where I am. Not too sure where exactly these tracks are heading to, so I'm trying to check here because it seems like they got disappeared somewhere here. So I am from the Bafalswook Dam. These lions has been there for drinking purposes earlier on. So I just have to check all these uh, small bushes here because these kind of predators can easily lie down and it's difficult to see them from a long distance. So maybe the tracks are heading back to the main road because I can see I'm not very far away from the main road at the moment. And this tracks looks like uh, it's for the males. So it maybe it's a coalition. So there's even more tracks here showing going up this side. Things has been happening here. So I'm just gonna show you the tracks here so that you can see these lions has been here on the ground. I can see it's nice and clear there. Yeah, you can see those are the fresh uh, tracks of uh, these lions. So the chances of seeing the lions in the area, they are getting very high at the moment. It's just that the wind is blowing, which is making it very difficult for me to judge the age of these tracks. So I'm just going to pull forward and see if maybe we can check around here until we pick up uh, convincing evidence. So now let's go to uh, James, who is looking for the cheetahs at the moment. I'm afraid we've kind of given up on our cheetah, simply because we don't want to miss the lions waking up in the cubs and end up with the TV show wafting a spotlight around with nothing to see. That would be hopeless. There's a beautiful zebra. You can look at that. Just look at the beautiful zebra. Good evening, madam. Yes, I see that you are pregnant heavily. Well done. Good job. Nearly carried your baby to term. Some 11 months she's had to have that thing in her belly. Kirsten, we're not going down the road of silly puns this evening. There were enough of those yesterday evening for the lightning. There's the sun going down. I want that sun going down either behind a cheetah or some lions. So we're going to press on. Are you ready, Manu? Yep. Very nice. Good. 
little roof of the nape lock gang. Call it after me, James, yes. Not sure she will. We might be very fortunate as we sort of drive through here and bump into her. I think she's probably spent the day away from her cubs because I've got an idea of where the cub den kind of was. So we might catch her coming back this way. Hello zebras. The other thing I love about the Mara, you're asking me what I love about it the most, is the smell. It's just a lovely smell, lovely fresh verdant grass smell. Uh, Mary, we are allowed to get out of the car if we wish to relieve ourselves, but we cannot get out and go tracking or walking. No, that is not allowed here. It's because it's a national reserve, basically, and you can get let people on. You know, the public can drive in. It's like the Kruger Park in South Africa. You can you can go walking with a with a ranger who works for the place, and we've done that once or twice. But you can't just get out of the car and walk, because obviously people will be flattened by the various fauna that have human flattening properties. Buffalo and elephant come to mind. In parts of Botswana and Zimbabwe you can do what you like. And uh, well, it's not surprising that they do lose people every year. They put up a sign that says, you know, go walking at your own risk. And well, people do and sometimes the risk doesn't pay off. Now, I think that during the Gauntlet series, when Scott and Brent were knocking around down here, the grass was probably about four feet tall, and it's now been eaten flat by the migration as it came through here. Paula, there are no marula trees here in the Masai Mara, no. You find them, I think, a little bit further south in Tanzania. You do not find them here, though. So they don't have a great marula jam beer general festivity season as they do in the low felt, which I've explained to you results in well an enormous lack of productivity. Human beings become vegetables for a little while, but the marula season is in play. No, that's not a cheat here either. Never mind. Back to the lions we go. All right, Tristain remains with Clalamba and uh, the moustache. You go back there. Well, no, she doesn't have a moustache anymore. She's now traded that in for a nest. She's decided she's going to go lie back where the grassy part is. She's had enough of being ridiculed with worry plants in her face and is now going to lie looking very, very regal in amongst the grass over there. So she looks quite content, doesn't she? She seems as though she's going to have a bit of a nap. I think the other vehicle arriving just now was um, probably a little bit kind of didn't feel like it. And so she moved off a little bit and has decided this is exactly where she can kind of see and watch what's going on and feel comfortable with the sort of grass behind her back. Aiden, who's seven years old, well, Aiden, we have a magic wand, and basically what happens is the magic wand is given to one of the trackers or the rangers that work out here, and it goes in the company of that animal, and they wave the magic wand, and a name spews forth and comes out of the end, and that's how we know what they are. No, I'm joking, Aiden, that's not the case at all. Um, basically, how it works is that we will watch a leopard or a lion or coalition. Lions are a little bit different to leopards in many respects. Lion coalitions normally have a name or um, prides have a name from an area that they've inhabited or something that makes them kind of get that name. And, and most of the prides have had names for quite some time that it's very sort of seldom that a new name comes along. But essentially what happens is that the rangers that work in the area as well as the trackers, they'll get together and they will put forward names that are traits that this this animal shows. So let's say like with Clalamba, meaning mischievous or playful or, or um, 
kind of they will then they decide okay well that's how she is and so let's give that name and and with her we got three names and you, you all decided which name you wanted to use but um essentially that's how it works i mean some areas it's not quite that they'll pick out three names they'll just pick out one but it is the guides that work on sites and normally it's the first guide that gets to see them so um you know it will be let's say Plalumba was found by Taxon first. Taxon will be normally the one that gets pre first preference as to what name he would like to put forward for that leopard and ID kind of name for her. So that's how it works. Us as guides for, for Wild Earth, we don't really participate in it at all. So even though we were the first ones to see little Plalumba, we didn't put forward any names at all. We asked Herbie to kind of represent us in that regard and Herbie kind of put the name forward with the rest of the guides and that's how we got all the names for her to choose from so you know that's how it normally works it's also about out of a little bit of respect you know Herbie and Tax and Aubrey um, and William and Fanuti they've spent so much time out in this area and Rexon um, and they they do a lot of tracking on foot and they find a lot of animals for us and they help us so much that you know they've been here for much longer and, and the the naming of these animals is far more kind of you know they they have the language they know the language they know the animals well and so it just feels better for for them to be doing it than for us you know we kind of come in and out and and none of us as, as guides have been here for remotely as long as what they have and so i don't know it feels better that they kind of do it than what we do and, and it also then removes any kind of emotion amongst presenters or anything like that or any boastfulness um we're happy with however it goes as long as you know it's it's the right kind of name that the guys have offered forward from themselves and not just kind of being pushed into it by us and the fact that they allow us to kind of participate in it is always very nice so it's a kind of returned respect that they have in, in many in many ways and that we can also include all of you is them being very kind of what would the word be well, they acknowledge the fact that it's very important that you know we have these kind of ID kits and that all of you like to be able to associate a name with a, with an animal and then allow all of you to participate in what an amazing kind of environment we're in as well as the, the specialness of making a connection with certain animals so yeah I think it works all the way around hopefully that wasn't too long an answer but it's definitely is the way that it goes it's basically the guides that, that name it that are from that particular lodge where that leopard is basically born or whatever the cat is that's born in and um, like i say you know things like cheetah lions don't really get individual names unless this is a, a real kind of trait that they have um here in south africa in the Masai Mara is slightly different um there you'll find all the male lions pretty much have names um a lot of even the females do too and all the cheetah um because of how many there are have names as opposed to the leopards there most of the leopards have no ID at all so it's quite interesting how down here because we see a lot more leopard and less cheetah all our leopards really have ID kits whereas the cheetah are a little bit kind of unknown whereas you know up there it's the complete opposite Lamba, are you done or are you still going to sit and wait for mom I was hoping she was going to go up towards the termite mound and pose beautifully for us in the late afternoon light but I don't think we're going to get that I think that's going to be a push too far I think she's going to decide to have a bit more of a nap and take it very very easy and wait for mom to start coming back rather than kind of moving around too much I really do hope Tony comes back this evening it will be so nice if she does it will definitely kind of make things quite interesting because I'm quite keen to see where she goes and which way she comes from I don't know, I mean, I suppose it's possible, you never know with Tandy, she does some random things at random times and I suppose she could be coming into an Easter cycle again and she mated early when she mated with um, with Tingana to to basically have Clalamba so it's possible that she could be going to an Easter cycle but you know the thing about Tandy is that I would be very 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 surprised is that if she went into an Easter cycle and didn't hook up with Tingana um, it's most of her territory falls within his and it would surprise me if we didn't find her also she's a, such a relaxed cat and when she's mating it's actually much easier to find her than it isn't because of her frequency of mating and so we would have heard a report of her mating somewhere I, I don't think she can creep around here without anybody finding her um, and so um, I don't think she's in Eustress yet uh, but it will come soon it's going to be within the next I would say three months we're going to start to see her coming into her first Eustress cycles and obviously when that happens and she mates then that kind of break of, of 
her and Clelumba starts to really kind of happen, particularly if she starts to feel like there's little ones inside her, then she starts to get quite aggressive quite quickly towards Clelumba. And it'll be very kind of interesting to see where Clelumba ends up. Uh, will she spend more time on this side, on Torchwood, or will she go back to kind of where she was born in that area? I suspect she's going to hang around between sort of... I reckon around Torchwood Camp and then up towards Bufflesick Dam, that kind of swathe there is going to be where Clalamba is going to spend a bit of time. The only problem is is that that skittish female is being seen around Bufflesick Dam a few times now, um, and so yes, maybe a little bit further south might be better for her. But it'll be interesting because obviously traditionally Tundi has always favoured the eastern side of Juma um, and the western side of Torchwood, but within Kanyeni having her side and her little female who's going to end up settling where is going to be quite kind of interesting. Good. We're going to sit with this little cat. We're going to see what it gets up to. In the meantime, though, back to Sydney, who's still searching for the lions. I was not lucky with the lions. The minute I got somewhere near the buffalo's hook, the lions crossed right into the buffalo zook area. So now I am changing the plans going down to the Chitwa Chitwa Dam in order to see what is happening around the Chitwa area. So the two male lions has just crossed. Maybe they will come back afterwards, shortly after the sunset. I'll come back again and see if there will be some lion activities later on. So this fire break here next to me is starting to recover the moment. I can see there's an area where there was a control bend dance some uh, few months ago, but now I can see that it's, it's now starting to get green again. So as soon as we receive good rains, this fire break is going to be completely green. Animals even starting to feed. I can see some impalas now are excited to feed from the fire break. So these are the impalas who are going to pressurize this fire break because feeding here too much is going to take away a lot of nutrients and the grass is, is not going to bring more nutrients until the rain is back. So the impalas, uh, they might start giving birth from the second week of December, a second week of um, November normally, which will be in two weeks time, not December, which will be in a week and a half time. That is when they are starting to give birth. So hopefully we might start to see the little ones, the lambs anytime soon. So when giving birth, impalas are too clever. They, most of them, they, I have been lucky with an impala giving birth before. And impalas normally, they give birth during the daytime when they know that the predators is when they are inactive. So at night, they know it's very dangerous. Most of their babies, they are coming during the day. So I'm just about to get to the Chitwa Chitwa Dam at the moment. Maybe we might be lucky with uh, some other lions there. The Unkuumas, they like that area a lot. Let's hope for the best. Maybe we will be lucky also with one of the spotted cats. So what I like the most about Chitwa Chitwa is that I always hit two birds with one stone. So the Chitwa Chitwa area is full of surprises.
So now let's go back to the Masai Mara where James is also driving around in search of the lovely animals. Right, we're back trying to find the lions. We haven't quite arrived where we left them, nearly. Slight to flutter in the stomach as to whether or not they're going to be there. Nearly there. Sun is going down. Lions could start to move. It's just about here, wasn't it? Or was it further along, Manu? Further along, oh, the next crops of trees. Whew. Hello, Shiloh. Ah, when you, to be to do this job, you've got to be very old, like me. I'm 27, and you need to be about 27 to do this job. No, I'm not 27. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you need to be, in South Africa, you need to have, it was here, you need to have a driver's license, which means you need to be at least 18. This is, uh, I'm in a mild panic now. Let's go and look inside this little drainage line. Hopefully they're there with the cubs. There's a lion. Whew! Small panic, don't worry, got the line. Uh, so Shiloh, you need to be at least 18 to drive a car, you've got to have 21, be 21 to guide. So to actually guide people, you've got to be 21 years old. But to do this job, to present, to drive a car and talk to camera, I guess all you really need is a driver's license and a well, pretty good knowledge of the wilderness. So as long as you have those two things, any age really. Thank goodness, there are the Sassage tree pride. Where are their babies? That's what I want to know. They're on the move, so they could be on the hunt. We arrived just at the right time. Not have been fun to have arrived here a little bit later. Now, will we see some baby sausages? That would be, that would be the best. You want, you want this angle? One who wants this angle of the sausage tree pride. There we go. I'll sit still now, shall I, Manu? Manu likes me to sit still, not break dance on the back here. As Kirsten says in her inimitably sarcastic manner, very artistic. Is that the kinky tail? No, it's not kinky tail. Kinky tail is one of the other two that we have here. No cubs as yet, and only two lionesses. There are five in the Sausage Tree Pride. And you can tell that the one is kinky tail by the color of her nose, which is in fact purple. I'm being sarcastic, you can tell by the kink in her left foot, yes. Keep watching, keep watching. No, that's not her. <laughs> Wonderful. It's what he tail, Kirsten, what did she say? Is it straight tail? Flippy. Flippy tail. So funny. We've got a gorgeous sunset going on. I'm gonna move forward and then we'll get you a picture of the sunset. Kirsten, I think you should be quiet. You reached a pinnacle of your joke skills, that's kinky tail there. Your joke skills reached their apogee yesterday evening with the lightning. That is a heavily, heavily pregnant lioness. Well, hopefully they'll lead us to the cubs. But let's just go a little bit forward and show you this gorgeous sunset, which is going down behind Kinky Tail. Is that all right? Beautiful. So beautiful. Mm. That really is rather lovely. I'm 
I'm afraid no camera can really do justice to the actual sight we are seeing here. I think, I wonder if they've eaten recently. I'm not sure that they have. I think that, no, well, that's one flippy tail. That's kinky tail there. She doesn't look very fat, but she looks foolish. Is that kinky tail? No, she, yes it is. Has she got a kink in her tail? We can't even see. She, that is her, yes. They've definitely been eating something. But I think that other one was also very heavily pregnant. And all of you enjoying the sunset? Thank you. Yes, we're enjoying it too. Very gorgeous. I was trying to take some illegal pictures of it and just, just not vaguely doing it justice. So where the other two members of the Sassage Tree Pride are, I don't know, but I'm going to hang around with these three because, well, I think that's a pretty good return. I'm not going to take an illegal picture with my telephone. Yes. Doop. Very good. Too pretty. Now they've got up and moved from where they were and I wonder if they've left the cubs because they're going to go hunting or if perhaps it's the other two that have cubs. Ah, now oh, there's a thought. But maybe they're going to go in search of the other two. And this one next to us is either very pregnant or very full of food. But see how she's not breathing very heavily. Lady Starfire, that's an interesting question, and I mean, it's, it's obviously there's a complicated answer to it. You say, if I came across a lion giving birth, would I stay in the sighting? The answer is, it depends entirely on the effect that I was having on the sighting. If we drove up onto this riverbed here, looked down, and there was a lioness giving birth in a, ca in a cave, and she didn't move because she's habituated to vehicles like these ones are, then I would sit very quietly and watch, absolutely. Would I tell anyone about it? Probably not, because, uh, you know, in a lodge situation, you absolutely wouldn't stay, because if one set of guests saw it, that guy, you know, every other guide would want to show their guests the same thing, and every other guest would want to see the same thing, which means that inevitably you would have to put pressure on that cat, and it would be a disaster for the cat. But if you happen to stumble across a lioness giving birth and she didn't react to you at all, well, there's no reason not to stay with her unless you are convinced that you are going to in some way endanger the lives of the cubs or the lioness. And, well, I just don't think that that's always the case. And it's very much similar with leopard cubs and when we stay with leopard cubs, and I know that you were asking Tristan earlier whether or not, you know, or at what stage we stay with cubs without their mothers. There's no hard and fast answer for that. Uh, in a lodge situation, you have to have a rule because, well, human beings being what they are, people are going to push boundaries to get their guests the best views. Guests are going to put pressure on their guides to get them the best views, and so there are boundaries. If, for example, you're a film crew and you happen upon a leopard cub on its own without its mother there, there's no, you're not lighting the place up, well, you know, there are a lot of people who are expert enough to decide whether or not you're going to impact that cub's life. If it's habituated and it doesn't happen to be uh, sort of, you know, it's in the daytime, you're not going to be turning on lights and making a noise, well, well then I don't think you are doing any harm. But in a lodge environment, you have to have these rules. And what applies to one must apply to everybody, you see. And so in many of the places where we operate, we do operate in a kind of lodge environment. Certainly at Juma we operate in a lodge environment. Here not so much. Here it's much bigger obviously. But it's why we have an Ascari on the back of the car to give us guidance if he feels we're putting too much pressure on the animals. 
Oh, Lily, I believe you've given me a, a thumbs up for that explanation. Thank you. Very pretty. I wonder if they'll go hunting. I'm hey me doots. I think there may well be flat cat, as it were, for the next few hours. But they have moved a bit, so maybe they'll get up and go. If you're wondering if I've ever come across an, a, uh, an abandoned cub, A and B, if I then took it into, and I quote, protective custody. Uh, no. No, I have never come across an abandoned cub, nor have I taken an animal into protective custody, as you put it. Um, it would be very tempting to do that, but I wouldn't. There are far too many examples of cubs being raised in captivity and then being released into the wild and being destroyed almost immediately by the locals. Uh, by the locals, I mean by the local animals. So, for example, if you were to bring a lion, you found a lion cub, and you thought it's shame, shame is it's going to die, and you fed it with a bottle, and then you fed it small pieces of bourrevors or sausage until it was a little bigger, and then when it was about two years old, you thought it's big enough now, and frankly I can't afford the feeding anymore, you spoke to experts and you released it into an area like this. Well, you can imagine, a lot of you know a lot about animal or lion behavior. If a two-year-old nomad with no experience of the wilderness like this was to come across a pride of lions, who knows what would happen? Most likely they'd kill him. And, you know, you just wouldn't know how to react. And the same goes for leopards. You know, if you put a leopard into an area where leopards can live, you can be very sure that there will be leopards in that area. If they can live there, they will, they will be there, and they will be territorial, and they will be intolerant of strangers, and especially strangers with no experience of how to deal with the complexities of leopard social life. And you can be pretty sure that they'll die. And there are countless examples of that. Countless examples, especially, you know, well-to-do filmmakers especially would like love to document the lives of animals being raised from cub where they've been rescued and almost universally they uh, they don't show you the tragic end that those animals suffer through no fault of the filmmaker it must be said but it is just extremely difficult to habituate an animal to the wild once it's been raised in captivity so to make a long story short i wouldn't as tempting as it would be to take hold of an abandoned leopard cub and try and raise it myself and rescue it, it would just be irresponsible. We as a species like to be irresponsible, but still. This is just so unbelievably beautiful. Crickets are starting to call. The old frog in the riverbed that surrounds us. The smell of this grass is too magical. I remember when I was a, a student, which was many, many years ago. Um, before I go and in, launch into this tree ties. Oh, no, there we go. We're okay. Um, my, I remember going out for my very first grassland science. Grassland science, what practical I suppose it was, and I remember the smell, and I remember thinking I've picked the right thing to study here, even if I don't enjoy the actual subject. I love the smell of coming out on fieldwork. All right, somebody who probably doesn't smell so fly is Tlalamba. Cool, we're going to go live now. I'll chat to you guys shortly. Now we're just saying hello to some of the guys that have joined us in the site, in which you can see not much has gone on with little Tlalamba. She's still very, very sleepy. She's going to probably, in all likelihood, be like this until such time as night kicks in. Um, in saying that, though, last night we spent most of the evening with her until about quarter to eight, and she didn't really move too much. She sort of sat around and, and just kind of sat on top of a termite mound. I wouldn't be surprised, though, as night falls that she moves off the ground and starts to find a termite mound. It's much safer for her up there. Um, she can see a lot more of what goes on. Remember that on the ground, her scent is going to be much easier to find, and things like hyenas will be 
generally milling about. Hyenas obviously have a nose for things, and if they pick up the scent of leopard, they generally come and scratch around. So far safer for her to, to kind of get off the ground and get onto a mound. It's much better up there. So I wouldn't be surprised if she gets up from here and slowly starts to move her way back towards a whole bunch of termite mounds where she came from this morning. So she obviously crossed the road hunting those impalas this morning, and I wouldn't be surprised she heads back that way and goes and lies up on them and waits for mom to come back. I really do hope that Tandy does come back. There's been lots of squirrels alarm calling kind of around us, but so far nothing has really materialized from it. She certainly doesn't look as though she's aware of anything around her, and, and I'm pretty sure as soon as Tandy comes into any sort of vicinity where birds alarm call or squirrels, she'll be quite interested to see what's going on. So she'll be a good indicator. I'm probably sh pretty sure she'll notice Tandy's arrival before we will. Um, and it'll be interesting whether Tandy heads this way or if she heads further to the east. Now, Kylie, you're asking about spot pattern 5-4 on Tlalamba. Um, so you can see there on her right side is the 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then on the other side is 4. So it's it's a 5-4 spot pattern that she has, 5 on the right, 4 on the left. Um, which is quite a quite a large number of spots. A lot of our leopards that we see here generally are three threes. That's mostly what we see is very few that go over that. And it's actually quite scary how many leopards have a three three spot button. Um, I've never had many more than five. I'm trying to think of any of the leopards that I've seen that have had more than five spots. There was one leopard that I remember having seven, but I can't remember who it was, or if it was even in the Sabi Sands. It might have been a picture that I saw from somewhere else. I can't remember. But most of them will have you know one two three. Four or five is kind of generally what you see um, on their, their sort of muzzles. Um, and like I say, Hosanna 3 3. Tingana's got a, quite, a, quite a high spot count as well. Um, what is quarantine? Um, James, Richard, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me what quarantine spot pattern is. I don't know offhand. I'd, I've only seen quarantine um, once on on Safari Live and actually once in general. So I don't know him very well. I'd be able to recognize him straight away if I saw him just because he looks so much like Mvula and I've seen so many photos of him, but I don't know what his spot pattern is. It's quite interesting to kind of think about that. Um, but just most of them are, are kind of in the lower numbers. Klalamba, are you going to wake up anytime soon? You've got a, a show that you've got to put on in sort of 45 minutes time. You need to start being a little bit more awake than what's going on now. I suppose she was in her cute phase when we first arrived and was quite sort of active that we can't complain too much that she's a little bit sleepy now. Yes, exactly, because we'll ask her nicely to go back and do the moustache for TV, although I don't think she will. To be honest, I think that was a little shady spot for the day, and she's now found a better spot to sit. But you see she's kind of twitching a little bit. That's typical cats when they're sleeping. You'll find that they do twitch quite a lot. Their paws and ears and often the back legs sort of kick out a little bit. And So I'm not surprised if she's having a really good nap. She hasn't been nearly as kind of awake as what she was when we first arrived, which surprises me because it's getting to that time of the day where it's cooling down and the sun is much lower and I thought she would have been a little bit more active now than it was during the hottest part of the day. But, you know, young leopards. Who knows what they actually think and what goes through their minds. But I'm hoping that she will wake up at some point because at the moment she's very sleepy. So a lot of you are saying 5-5. Five, five. This is the debate that is rage because Brent and I had this debate uh, the other day about it. And Brent is convinced that he it's 5-4 and, and I said to him, are you sure? And he said yes. Um, and he said he saw it quite close and that one spot is amalgamated with the other, but could be wrong. Like I say, I mean, I, does anyone have really good shots of either side of her face um, that they can share with us? And we can end the debate then if we've got really good shots of it. Um, it would be quite, quite simple. I know Brent got a really nice sort of side profile of her the other day um, on either side. Um, so maybe those or somebody else has got... Um, spots. Uh, to be honest, it's funny. The spot pattern thing is an interesting thing because a lot of a lot of people who work with outside of of the areas will use spot patterns effectively. And, and certainly, when you're looking at photographs, spot patterns is your way to go by a long shot. Um, and they're generally the most accurate, obviously. Um, but being out here, a spot pattern almost becomes irrelevant at times unless you're a little unsure. Then spots can help. But for the most part, you know, a lot of the leopards that we see um, generally, 
you go by look and by what they sort of the general overall appearance of them um, that's normally how i go about it so i'll kind of look at hosan and i know it's him before i even kind of see his spots um, and also remember that spots are a long way away for us it's not like a zoomed in picture that you're getting when we kind of have the camera right on them so when we see them from afar you know you've got to learn their sort of normal attributes and the way that they just look from distance we can't our eyes are not good enough to see their spots straight away um, and so you kind of learn to recognize them without a spot pattern um, you just learn to see their overall appearance and the way that they look and, and that kind of generally goes of course there are times when we get it wrong and then there's times where we come beside these things it's part and parcel of human error and nature um, and we don't have the ability to pause and, and rewind and to, to kind of green grab something when we're following a leopard through the bush so sometimes we get it wrong and and it's not i promise you it's not intentional when we do but for the most part it's they find it much easier to recognize a leopard via its general look than trying to look for spot patterns because it's it's almost impossible to see spots on both sides of the face of a leopard when you're following it particularly if it's mobile it's one thing if it's sitting like this and is posing beautifully but when they're moving it's it's a nightmare um, and it's amazing to me that sometimes leopards can be a funny thing because you know, when you see Tandi or Hosanna or Tingana up close, they you immediately know who they are. It's, it's uh, very difficult. But when they're a little bit further away and a little bit of a thicket, sometimes your mind can play tricks on you and you can be a little unsure and you kind of call it and you're not really that kind of convinced by your sort of idea. And then when you get a little closer, you realize actually it's it is them but it's it's one of those things I, I mean there's always each to their own i know some guides will use spot pat patterns religiously for me i i don't really so a lot of the time when people ask me spot patterns of the leopards that we see i don't really know them very well at all because it's not the way that we id them um obviously if it's a newcomer then we'll try use that but once you get to know them very well then it starts to become almost like i say a little bit difficult to really notice what the spots are from the distances that we spend time at but you can hear there's some pearl spotted islets that are starting to call as well now sorry Chris, if you can just repeat that it just broke up when you were talking So apparently Kirsty was starting to choke and that's why I didn't actually hear half of what she said. But so I can't, are spot patterns inherited? Um, no, not exactly. Um, otherwise you'd find leopards that would be exactly the same. But there are some spots that seem to kind of carry through a little bit. Now, I know this is a big call, but if somebody's got a full profile, or well not profile, but a head-on shot of Clalamba with, with her kind of normal look about her, not with her eyes wide, um, there maybe like that shot now you'll notice and I know a lot of you will probably think that I'm crazy but she almost has a, a few spots that roughly line up to kind of almost match a little bit of what Karula's wow was it doesn't say wow as easily as what Karula's did but there's definitely a little kind of shape there that's quite similar so I think that they do inherit certain spots on them I don't think it's it's always going it's obviously not the same in any way and the spots do differ but there's certain spots that you sometimes kind of see on a leopard and you think to yourself well that could easily have carried down from mom or from maybe even grandmother or father or something like that and so sometimes you do get these kind of little marks now she's of course she's going to hide her head now so that we can't actually get that pattern but it's not like I say it's not a full wow like Karula had but there's a few little spots there that kind of look and remind me a little bit of Karula's spot pattern between her eyes on her forehead now she's gonna even tuck it down further lift your head so I can see okay but now you have to turn towards us no she's not going to do that she's going to sleep that's better I don't know. Maybe not. Looks a little bit like it to me. I don't know. There's still little kind of small spots that she's got there. Not quite the same marking. But uh, I don't know. I mean, it's a debate. So there's always this kind of talk about whether or not they do inherit spots. As we know, they definitely don't inherit all of the spots. But I wonder if there's maybe one or two kind of that come through here and there. And there's so many spots on them that to check every single one would be quite tricky in terms of uh, matching them all up and, and seeing whether or not spots carry through from the adults and, and also how far back do you go because maybe it skips a generation or something like that. I don't know. Interesting kind of topic. I don't know if anyone's ever studied it, to be honest, as to whether spots carry over from the parents. Clalamba? Is it wake up time 
Or are you gonna still sleep for a while longer? Seems like we're gonna sleep for a while longer. Yep, I'm going to go back to sleep. I really do hope Tundi arrives at some point. It would be nice to see Tundi too. I don't see much of her these days and she's been very elusive. So very kind of looking forward to her having come today and very surprised that she hasn't made an appearance yet at all over the course of the last sort of 24 hours that little clalumba has been sitting in fact it's more it's almost 36 hours now that clalumba has been sitting here on her own so i do hope that tandy does come and arrive at some point right now it sounds like james is busy with his infrared at the moment and sydney's i think still making his way towards chitwa so you still stuck with us in our sleepy leopard who well like i say is taking it very very easy at the moment i actually think sydney should have just joined jamie this afternoon because he's also had a fairly easy afternoon of it and <laughs> taken it very easy craig's laughing at the back here the two of them the two, two of them are the TV stars for this afternoon. I expect lots of things from them this evening then during TV. And hopefully they've enjoyed having a nice sort of relaxing break. Um, I I know though that uh, obviously earlier we were joking around about Jamie being a TV star not wanting to do internet drive. Of course that's absolute nonsense. It's that Jigger is broken. So Jigger has got an internal clutch bearing issue which is not ideal and so she's decided to just retire Jigger for the afternoon until such time as the TV show try to get it through the TV show and then Jigger will be decommissioned tomorrow for two days as the gearbox gets hauled out and the internal clutch bearing gets changed by our master mechanic Opa and so that's what's going to happen to Jigger and I suppose Jigger's getting old that these things do happen from time to time and unfortunately you will see kind of these changes in their cars every now and then and you know Rusty was in the doctor for a while so I suppose it is only fair that Jigger goes and gets a little bit of a kind of look after she's an old lady now to this Jigger been around for quite some time and has had a tough life in many respects it's been obviously driven around by us hooligans which is never easy for any car I don't think even Rusty and Wendy have certainly bore the brunt of our driving oh delightful yes now it sounds like the host of this show and his majesty J sir james henry has powdered his nose and um, powdered his head and is now ready for us up in the mara in order to entertain you all as we kind of close out our afternoon it can only have come from mr t dix i suppose um yes i've powdered my nose it feels powdery which i don't think is a particularly good way to keep your nose but you know so it is, and I'm now trying to set up various night equipment, much of which I'm going to leave uh, in the wilderness right here. It's uh, so unspeakably useless that Manu said, you have to use this for TV shows. So I took his instruction. I think I'd love to know where this instruction comes from. I think I have, my, I have, I have an idea. And, well, basically, what I've done is tied myself into about six or seven feet of wire it's all over me now and I, I i mean none of this is making a picture of anything it's just here i think we'll just go to the lions kirsten now says i sound like a diva well you would too if you'd been tied yourself in a knot with six feet of useless wire Anyway, that's the sausage tree pride, Lioness. They did get up and started sort of looking down towards where they'd come from, now, almost as if they might go hunting. But then they didn't anymore. They are so distinctive looking in comparison with the Kruger lions. It really is amazing. A little bit of a wound on her neck there. And for those of you who are perhaps a little bit new to the show, for me the most obvious distinction is the fact that they've got such big square boxy ears with lots of hair on them. Tristan, I think, came up with a very nice theory as to why they've got hairy ears, and he says he reckons it's to shut up, you useless implement. It's to deal with the, the wind. Interestingly, this female doesn't have a very hairy ear. I can 
hear some ground hornbills going in the distance. You won't be able to hear them with the microphone, so you'll just have to make do with my impression thereof. Oh, that's gorgeous. Isn't it pretty? I've said that a lot today, but really, I think I've been justified. Just a little bit of silence. See what we can hear. Last calls of the Rufus named Lark. Apparently, you can just hear the calls of the ground hornbills going. Very nice. Well, what I want to hear now is the contact call of the two lionesses of the cubs. Because that will then fill me with great joy. I haven't seen lion cubs for a while. I'd like to meet the new sausages, the chipolatas. <laughs> At the moment, however, they don't look like they want to show us anything other than their skills at sleeping. Yes, Maria, it is it's rather intimidating but most impressive at the same time. The way the infrared reflects off the tatum lucidum at the back of the lion's eye. Now, what's also quite interesting is when you see them at a distance, you can't actually see their bodies. It just you can get that sort of quintessential cartoon picture, if you like, if they're so far away that you can't, that the infrared doesn't pick up the body, but you can just see the eyes shining, and it really looks very eerie indeed. She's definitely heard something. Maybe a lion far off to the south. I can't hear a lion myself, though. Looking very sphinxish at the moment. Not a sphinxish lion. And also, remarkably, this evening is that it's still there's no wind. The wind does blow here quite a lot. I mean, I've said this as a slight breeze comes up but it often does blow up a storm at this time of the day. Well, she's going to sleep. Ah, now many of you are asking when our SABC show is. It is tonight, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, on their third channel, SABC3, this evening at 6.30. Central African time, that's 6.30 in South Africa, 7.30 in Kenya, where I'm sitting. And so I'm just going to be an hour in front of everybody today on the TV show. And then it goes for an hour until 8.30 our time, 7.30 South African time. Absolutely useless, just shouting at me, it's beeping. <laughs> useless. We should just leave it here and then he who wants us to use it can come and fetch it in the morning. Yes, Anna Marie, you were saying how silent it is in the Mara. Well, it's quite silent about this piece of equipment that's been foisted on me. Now I've detached it. I will be giving it back to Manu. Grumpy old man, you say, did I try turning it off and on again? I actually did. I did that three or four times, and it turned on, and then it turned off again each time. There's a fault. Probably be a fault with me, but I'm not going to try and seek that fault right now. 
I'm just going to place it there for mine to deal with. Good. What a lovely evening to be out. Sunday and the Masai Mara, the entire reserve to ourselves and nobody else about. Except the Sausage Tree Pride. Now, I do hope fervently that they're going to do slightly more than they are doing now when we have our TV show. Yes, it's all very well, you know, shooting the breeze, as it were, with these lions and with you about these lions, but really when TV comes we'd like them to perform slightly. Pirouettes, maybe a little bit of playing, some grooming, and then some finding of baby lions, so that the audience can go, Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, as we do, and talk in baby voices. The final control is all talking in baby voices when Jamie introduced you to that tiny elephant today. I wonder if she's got her makeup on. Jamie likes to spend an extended period readying herself for TV <laughs> for TV shows. Kirsten's just said in my ear, because it was so cute. It was so cute. Nothing, of course, is cuter than luck cubs, and with any luck we'll have some of those. Now get up and go and get your lion cubs. Come on. Flying high, you say, wouldn't it be fun if the car battery died? Flying high, uh, in a word, no. It wouldn't be fun if the car battery died. Uh, it wouldn't be fun because, well, as you can well imagine, it'd be difficult to push the car at this stage here. Uh, it'd be difficult to get somebody down to us on account of the fact that we don't actually have any cell phone signals. So to give them a pin would be hard. Mm, no, I don't think it would be fun. I did actually run the battery flat on this very car a few nights ago. I managed to leave the light on. And so when Pat and Claudie got into it to start the engine, it was dead. And I wanted to blame everybody else, but unfortunately had to blame myself, which hurt me deeply to the core of my being. Anyway, we have survived. Here we are, in the same car, and the lights are off. Now, I don't know, but Manu, does it look like to you she may have been suckling? I don't think she has. Mm -mm. I think those are just fairly swollen. Maybe she's also pregnant. Mm. All right, let's go across to Sidders, who apparently has now also got some Leonies. I am just here by the Chitwa Chitwa, and we are lucky to have the Unku Umas. At the moment, the Unku Umas, the whole pride, is just lying down here. So fortunately, we managed to get hold of the big cats. Look at that. This is an incredible sighting. So they are all still sleeping here at the moment, but I can see that the sun is going down and the temperature is cooling. We might start seeing some activities here very shortly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's ten of them. I can see the three from the Mangeni uh, Pride, as well as the two, four, six, uh, seven from the Unkuhuma Pride. So you can see the Mangeni Pride. They are trying to. He's trying to lick himself. He's doing some self grooming. So these are one of those, so that is one of those um, Mangeni lions, the one who is having the problem with the mange, which is part of a skin disease transmitted by some of the, uh, some of the mites. So it's kind of a parasite. So I am very happy that we got the lions after such a very long search.
so you can see they are very close to each other so this helps in order to uh, warm them Uh, the the mane looks better by the young males. This mane they starts to grow when they are just about two years, and that is when uh, they start to get chased away because the mane is coming down. When the mane is starting to develop, it starts to irritate the dominant males in the territories. Look at that. None of the unkuhuma is. Uh, grooming the mangani lion so you can see they're now starting to stretch at the moment so i can't wait to see what their plans are for this evening and thank you very very much it has been a fantastic afternoon and thank you very very much for all your questions and comments let's meet again tomorrow